George Mackay, hello, welcome. <laughs> hello, thank you. Thank you for being here. Ah, thanks for having me. Oh mate, really, um, I watched them. So it's really great to have you here so we can talk about this film. I'm a nice guy. If you disrespect me, f you up. I get that. Yeah, I'm the same. Are you now? What a film, what a performance. You're kind of unrecognisable in your own way in this film. What is it about roles in, or, or characters that come your way? Do you look at them and go, I can disappear into this. This is what I want to play this role. This is the next one for me. I love diving in. It's to, and, and, you want, and you want to sort of find something where, that you're stretching yourself as an actor. I think the point of acting is to, you know, you play different characters and the best thing is to sort of be unrecognisable if, mm. if you can be. And I, I think, so therefore pushing and reaching in, as far as you can in all sorts of different directions and immersing yourself and disappearing into it is is the kind of the only way really. Mm -hmm. Preston just as a character is so fascinating. I mean, he's got so much going on in him and then sort of what that kind of um, clash in, inside himself has caused this sort of, this character to be created that he sort of lives inside of. And yet that character that he's created also is born out of a true part of himself to, to hide another true part of himself. So he's this kind of amazing conundrum. There must be a tussle as well for, uh, for an actor with the characters you play, because I'm sure you spend so much time with that character and the material and you find nuances in them that, you know, viewers might not get necessarily if they watch the film that you yourself kind of can hang on the character. Yeah. And he is, like you say, such a um, volatile character, but there's elements of him that you, where he shows sensitivity and it means kind of more because he's not like that at all in, in other scenes. But his situation is so unique yeah. that is there any moments or any kind of struggle with the tussle of this is a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy and you're the person who has, has to convey that? Yeah, of course. There's, there's, I remember when I read the script, I mean, there's certain actions that Preston takes, especially at the beginning, which are just terrible. Mm. And, and you kind of, you know, you're kind of mindful of what you're jumping into and, and the reverberations of that, um, not just the, the, the actual doing, the doing of it. But, um, but I don't think you can kind of, in the plane of him, once you've sort of, I guess, made your judgments as a reader, then it's about just understanding why that person does it. And that, eh, the, I guess, empathy or just that exercise mm. just takes away the sort of prejudice of your own character that you might that you might have. The film's about identity and the identities that we create for ourselves. And it's that identity is almost bigger than your mortal health. It's it is bigger than life and death, the kind of persona that he's created. If that goes, mm. that's his entire that's his entirety destroyed. Mm. So if anyone punctures that and it is so fragile and almost that thing that, you know, the higher the tower, the greater they fall. Yeah. It is so big and so broad and so strong that if it kind of gets kind of punctured and it deflates, that's his entire being gone. Don't bother messaging me later when you're looking for a to sell. you not know each other? Obviously, very toxic as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, not healthy. <laughs> not healthy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and very toxic. And like, I just guess for, you know, the scenes, obviously the depiction of sex in this, you know, because it's, it's an erotic film, but it's got this kind of toxicity um, underlying tone throughout it as well. So when it comes to doing sex scenes as as stark as the ones in Femme, and yet it's kind of complicated by being not just a straightforward sex scene, right? Um, what do you do like, w when you're reading that or when you're, you're on set, you're about to kind of get going with the scene? What's going through your mind? Do you speak with Nathan? The thing is, is with this, I mean, with this film particularly, the, the sex and the sex scenes in it are so fundamental to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like they are pillars within the plot, the nature of each each kind of, each time they have sex, what each character is trying to perform for the others, first and foremost, mm -hmm. and like scenes, it wasn't like, you know, a sex scene or a fight scene or a stunt scene. All of them, they were there to to, to move the story forward. Um, so we, we approached them kind of, first and foremost is that, like what, what is Preston trying to achieve in this moment? What is Jules trying to achieve for this moment? Then the bird's eye view of like, what needs to happen to move the story forward in the way that, that we want it to. Then we had an amazing intimacy coordinator called Robbie Taylor Hunt, who helped this sort of on that journey in the kind of the choreography and then, and kind of just created a safe, a safe space because once you know what your intention is, once you know what 
you have to achieve within it, then it's about like kind of letting yourself go. And Robbie was there to help put in the kind of the structures and the safety sort of boundaries. It would be impo- surely it would be impossible to do it without a scene partner who you oh. have that understanding with, right? It's, yeah, and, yeah, and I think actually maybe that sort of led to the kind of openness with which Nathan and I worked together. Like we didn't have a huge amount of time. We had a week's rehearsal after we were both cast mm. where we went like when we, we met and began the sort of the project together basically and with Sam and Ping our, our directors and there was this sort of kind of open-minded pragmatism almost of like right we've got to do a lot of intimate stuff we've got to have a lot of sex we've got to fight we've got to have this relationship that goes on the journey that it does a lot of things that you're and we're, you know and we're going to start in a week so right. like, you yeah. know so let's let's be open let's let's not let's not kind of you know let's just let's go sort of everything sort of arms and eyes our hearts wide open um, and that just sort of set us in a good, a good footing to kind of continue. Talking about, you know, the casting process, um, was it a long one? Um, did you do anything to kind of convince the directors that maybe you were the one for the job? So I was, I was, I was really lucky that um, Sam and Ping wanted, at first wanted to just have a conversation. Um, and I think they had me in mind for the, for, for the role. Um, and it was so we just we we had a, a meal together and they sort of expressed their vision for the film and their ambition for the film as well. And and the kind of the nuance, the clarity and then the ambition with which they both spoke was so inspiring, coupled with this absolutely kind of I don't know, the sharp as hell script that they'd written. Yeah. Um, and then the short. Uh, which which they'd made as well, which again, they're, they're different characters, but a, a kind of equivalent characters in a, in a world that they were exploring in, in the short that was called Femme, that was Papa Asedu and Harris Dickinson playing Nathan and, and I's characters in that. Um, and coupled with the quality of that short, the articulacy of their vision and the script, and them just being lovely, lovely people as well. It's, it's a partnership. So Nathan and I had a chemistry read together to, to see if, you know, we'd work as that partnership. Um, and Nathan had, had come in from working, I swear he'd been working on something else about two minutes before the audition. Really. He'd come straight off a night shoot, he sort of came into the room and he had to leave like immediately afterwards. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and he came in knackered. And I think that sort of almost, ha- he was kind of hysterically tired because he hadn't slept. And we went outside, we had a, a he had a wee coffee and, uh, and we kind of went through the scenes and it was just sort of, again, this very giggly sort of openness immediately. And then we, we began with uh, a scene from the film where they're at dinner, they're kind of on a, a kind of call it a date together. Yeah. And um, there was this sort of moment within it where we kind of, there was this sort of flirtatious spark, but there's the whole thing's a chess match because you're not sure, Preston's not sure what Jules thinks and Jules isn't sure what and everyone's got their own agenda underneath yeah. it and the fronts that they're putting on and their own feelings underneath. So the whole thing's this really delicate chess match and there was this kind of moment of, of um, sort of fire in it, I guess. And I think we both kind of felt the excitement of that. Um, and then the final aspect was Nathan, the job that he'd just been doing, he was enormous. He had so many, such big muscles and I didn't. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and Preston's meant to be and this rough, tough fellow and yeah. I needed to be all intimidating. <laughs> so it was after that, it was like, right, Nathan, you need to slim down and George, you need to build up. Did you do anything else kind of to, to get into the mindset, I guess? How, did, how does one research getting into yeah, character as a very toxic individual. I I, I felt like the, the script is wonderfully nuanced, and I felt like so maybe something within Preston is that his he cannot get past the fundamental clash that is sort of his sexuality banging up against his idea of his masculinity, and I, I and I think that without ever wanting to simplify him, I wanted to kind of make the way that he thought quite solid. You know, the older I get, I think the more kind of grey life gets. It's not black, it's not white. It's this kind of beautiful grey in the middle. Um, but I think I wanted to kind of press them to be very sort of blocky in his thinking. That it's either this or it's this. And if it's not that, then they clash. And how does that work? And and that is a real, so there's a solidity to everything he comes up against. That it's sort of, there's no bending. It's like, how can that go against that? that that's going to clash. Fashion as well was another thing. I'm not massively fashionable myself. Um, <laughs> I don't and, believe that. Come on. Well, you know, I do, my, I do my best. But like, it's important. I think Preston has a real interest in clothes. And again, there's a sort of nugget of information that that is a passion of his. Yeah. That he has, he has a vision with this and, and, he's, and he keeps tabs on all of this. I think he's lent heavily on what's cool at what point. And so has shape-shifted 
all his life. When this was cool, he did that. When that was cool, he did that. And when that was cool, he did that. And so we tried to plot that in the tattoos as well that kind of show the phases that he went through. And we meet him, you know, the film takes place over a short period of time. But I imagine that if we went through the years with Preston, he'd probably look extremely different at yeah. different points. When you um, kind of get into a role as deeply as you, you did with Preston, and then, you know, cameras stop rolling the week after, how long does it take you to detach? I think it depends on the way in which the, your directors are working. And Sam and Ping sp spoke from the beginning about how important the edit was to this, into kind of um, gauging and getting the level right for this chess match. And so often within takes we do, if we're doing a scene like this, they do like, okay, do the interview where you're like really happy all the time, or do the interview where you're a bit standoffish all mm. the time, all within the character, but kind of dialing up versions of the character of, in the scene. And that was sort of quite a, um, it was almost like an acting exercise. It wasn't like you were being him the whole time. See. The story is so well written. Yeah. The guys have written such a tight script that it was about kind of, okay, how can we make this beat be as, as, as strong as it can be? And so there was a almost analytical aspect to it as well. Yeah. And maybe that helped being able to disengage Afterwards. kind of kind of quick. Come on, man. So look, this is this being called Go to Bat. We um, we get guests on and to, to to go to bat for a project from their back catalogue that they generally think deserves more love. Um, can you tell us what film you're going to bat for today? George? Yeah, I'm I'm going to uh, bat for uh, a film I did years ago now, um, yeah, nearly ten years ago, called Bypass. You need to come back. Tell me. It's a very low budget, we um, British indie, um, directed by an amazing director, Dwayne Hopkins. And it was a really fundamental learning experience and everyone on it absolutely threw themselves at it. And just, you know, the luck of the draw, it kind of came and went in the cinema right. a wee bit. And also is not a film that had the budget to support, you know, promoting itself in, in the way that it would have liked to. It, it you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful film, but it's not necessarily an, an easy film. Yeah. And so when you don't get that kind of wave of kind of reviews with a film like that, that you can kind of ride on um, for other people to then pick it up, it kind of, it, it, it came and went, frankly, a wee yeah. bit. What is your kind of overarching memory of starring in that film? Or like, I guess, learning you've got the role and yeah. your experience. What, what, what are the memories that linger with you? It was um, like a rigour. It was Dwayne, um, Dwayne Hopkins made a really beautiful first film called Better Things, mm. um, and he, had, the cast in that were phenomenal. And other, I think, I think Michael Soccer was in it, but otherwise, I think predominantly it was street casting. Mm. And t and Tim's background, the, the fellow I play, is, is is different to mine. His situation was different to mine. He's he's a different person, but Dwayne was really, and I was so hungry to have an experience akin to that. Um, really pushed me to, to to, to sort of live elements of my life close to close to um, the way that Tim lived. And also just the kind of the rigor of it, like like Dwayne did many, many takes. Um, and he's kind of went up and exhaust the scene. And then once we kind of got to the absolutely exhausted phase, but then kind of work back down to where we felt the sweet spot, sweet spot that we had passed. So yeah, it, it, was, a, it was the hardest I've ever worked um, up at that point and sort of, push the new boundary as to like, oh, okay, that's how hard you can work on something. Mm -hmm. And something since then I've tried to keep up with or push again. So like with the character Tim, there's a lot going on in Tim's life. Um, but what I what struck me is how little he talks, actually. Yeah. It's quite dialogue free in, in many ways. Um, it's all in your facial expressions. Silence is like a character in the film. Is that like, you know, it, learning scripts, obviously, I don't know how you do it, like, <laughs> especially if it's like, you know, if you're in like a Tarantino film, you'd be like, what? I, yeah. I'm going to be sat here for weeks. But then is there like this other, on the opposite end of the spectrum, this struggle when you, you know, it is all about the science and it is all in you and your facial expressions to kind of convey the emotion required to make a scene work? I guess, I guess so. Like you sort of learn the beats of a scene as well, like the, the choreography that hopefully is completely unconscious, but the order with which you go and sort of take the things in, around the room or, you know, do the, the tasks that you need to do if you're not speaking, often are really kind of are as intricately plotted as the dialogue. That film, another thing that I always remember was we had an amazing um, 
a makeup makeup designer called Alessandro Bertolassi, who works on some phenomenal films, but loved the script and came and did this film. And that my character Tim is is not well. And initially, given the sort of the rigor that I'd learned from Dwayne, I wanted to be very specific about what he was suffering from. And then so we we hadn't kind of nailed it down. That was the one bit that I was like, but is it this? Is it this? And I remember when Alessandro arrived, he went, No, it's his conscience. The illness is his conscience. It's when he is pushed to do things that feel immoral. I bet that I can unlock so many avenues as an actor yeah. when there's a scene you're struggling with. Yeah, or even just like, and that's where like the work that Dwayne got us to do is you sort of, whatever it is, say you decide that, I don't know, like his, he had a relation, or you know, his dad had rips in his jeans or something, then you know that that he's thinking about his dad or something, and you know what you're doing, but no one else knows what that is. But that, as long as it makes sense to you, it's gonna read in some way. So that was the same year Pride came out. Yes. So obviously two different trajectories for those films. Yeah. Um, like what did you carry with you into your future career? Um, you've answered a lot, so what I'll ask is, um, kind of, do you kind of think about your experiences on that film when you're on set of a film like 1917? With, and there with, are moments. With, with Bypass. With Bypass, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for Do sure, you, totally. Yeah. Especially physical stuff as well. Like there was, there's a scene where the character has a has a seizure, and kind of, rather than just doing the sort of surface of it, kind of again knowing that the illness was about morality, like trying to come up with like a movement that was specific to a certain very personal idea with the character. I'm gonna to have to race in a few minutes. There might be other cars on the way. Do not freeze on me now, Tim. Run! The film's so personal, there'll be films that like really speak to me that no one else would have sort of seen. Um, so I think it's sort of trying not to, it's amazing when it, when it happens yeah. sort of thing, but I think timing's a big thing. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the moment that it's like an alignment of things um, to, you know, what 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 people kind of want want and need to see maybe what the, there's that there's space for it that the moment's right for it that obviously there's money to kind of fund the promotion of it of course, yeah. um it's that age-old thing of timing when the time is right you know it will it it will it will hit you know i don't know if you know it's, it's actually on amazon prime right now is it yeah oh well, so, there you go so people need to check that out on amazon okay prime. Yeah. yeah cool but no thank you so much for your time george no thank you, you. <laughs> thank you so much Cheers. appreciate it george much.